Hi, you are currently being recorded on Pixel Vision. Flip that red live light on, Bruno. Thank you. You know, it's our 33rd year of Pixel This, Pixel Purity, the children of paradise. Let us pray. Let us pry. Let us pixel. Pixel fingerprints. Dude, we got Stanley Kubrick here. Wow. Great to be here. And I want to tell everyone that this lo-fi hijinks has been a part of my Kubrickian multiverse since my inception at birth. So please enjoy this pixel fest. When the cow got out, an entire picnic, frozen upside down in the black round of her dumb eye.
Hey, bud, what you doing? Art. What you doing? Uh, life? Same thing. Art. Life. Both ways of doing time. Except art gives me a frame in which to do my time. Listen to 
I climbed the Cascades, but not alone. We met the crest, but for just a while. Climbing up, you took my hand, a hike along a promised land. We made it last where the ferns curl back. I had one thought inside of me, the moss so soft and wet beneath me. Our shoulders felt each other's hands. We saw the air and we smelled the sand. We reached the peak. I saw it all. The wrong perfume, the midnight call. I placed my trust where I dropped my feet. My shoulders ache with a great deceit. Pushing on, I cast off the chart. I confront you even now with your empty heart. I confront you even now with your empty heart. The rope is taut and interlaced. Volcanic stone plunges from the face. And then you stood on the crystal air and then you were never really there. Don't cry, darling, just because we're all alone. Don't cry, darling, just because we're all alone.
Well, you should read Finnegan's Wake because it's probably the most intense English prose ever written. And the book is alive if you are. Are you alive? Find out by reading Finnegan's Wake. Truly alive. The book will give back the more you put into it. It's a living thing. And if you're careful, if you pay attention carefully, it will predict the future for you. Just kidding. Not really. Read Finnegan's Wake. It's the best novel ever. I want to talk about free will. I want to talk about no matter what the influence you have, parents, stars, addictions, you, I, and the man behind the curtain have free will. You can talk about your influences, 
But when push comes to shove, you're the decider. There's no excuses. Explanations, perhaps, but no excuses. And this is kind of wonderful, you know? You can do whatever you think you should do. Despite your parents, despite the way you look, despite your gender, despite your bank account, you can decide. So, of my own free will, I'm going to say, that's what I have to say about this. So, if you did listen, thank you. If you didn't listen, thank you anyway. Bye-bye. The Owl and the Pussycat The Owl and the Pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea-green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five-pound note. The Owl looked up to the stars above and he sang to a small guitar. Oh, lovely pussy, oh, pussy, my love, what a beautiful pussy you are, you are, what a beautiful pussy you are. Pussy said to the owl, hmm, you elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing. Oh, let us be married, too long we have tarried. But what shall we do for a ring? They sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the bong tree grows. And there, in a wood, a piggy wig stood with a ring on the end of his nose. His nose! His nose! With a ring on the end of his nose. Dear pig, are you willing to sell for one shilling your ring? Said the piggy, I will! So they took it away and were married next day by the turkey who lived on the hill. They dined on mince and uh, slices of quince which they ate with a runcible spoon. And hand in hand at the edge of the sand, they danced by the light of the moon, the moon, the moon. They danced by the light of the moon. Hello. Uh, today I'm going to speak about uh, nine syllables uh, from Finnegan's Wake. Uh, the syllables are like this. The ran, the ran, that keen of old bards. Now this is, this is a play on the wren song, which appears in Ulysses, it appears in Frazier's Golden Bough, it appears in the Recognitions, the White Goddess. But um, basically, as Fraser says, the rain is a sacred animal, is taken from house to house, that all may enjoy a share of its divine influence. Of course, it's killed. Um, but the, uh, the ritual was performed on St. Stephen's Day, and it was accompanied by the uh, chant, the wren, the wren, the king of all birds, St. Stephen's Day was caught in the furs. Now, of course, Joyce would have appreciated St. Stephen since his alter ego uh, was Stephen, the proto-martyr, St. Stephen. And uh, 
in Ulysses, there's even when, when Bloom is car uh, is made the king, uh, Bloom's boys even come around singing the Wren song. But I like this uh, this phrase because in nine syllables you have five puns. And for the Wren, you have the Wren twice. For the king, you have keen, which is an, a lamentation. For old, you you have all. For birds, you have bards. And, um, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Saint Stephen. You know, cor according to the Fialcan theory of causation, Joyce must have been influenced by the Grateful Dead. Uh, Saint Stephen, with a rose in and out of the garden, he goes. And uh, I would say Joyce, uh, the uh, uh, Joyce even revised this a very nice line: "All he lost, he shall regain." And in the, in the wake, that's revised into such as Manawet's lot of lose and win again. And um, you may not know, but uh, Bloom's original name before it was Bloom was Hunter. Was that a coincidence? I don't think so. So I think Robert Hunter plays a big role. So the the Wren song, uh, in and out, um, I mean, uh, St. Stephen, his day uh, was caught in the furs, is part of this uh, these uh, lamentations for the dying God, where bitter lamentation is followed by joyous uh, revival. And... Um, in the, the the way that that the wake does it, the ran, the ran, the ran being a stanza of Irish verse, that keen of old bards, meaning a bitter lament of the old bards, perhaps lamenting the seasonal sacrifice of the animal spirit or vegetation god. And I just want to close with. Um, uh, there's also a, a hint of Yeats, because uh, he, he has a very famous poem where he says, Know that I would account it be true brother of a company that sang to sweeten Ireland's wrong story and ballad, ran and song. So he talks about the ran as a way of sweetening Ireland's wrong, you know, the many injustices Ireland had experienced in history and perhaps uh, sweetening it through through poetry. So I think all of those things are contained in these nine syllables and probably more things as well. But I'm going to stop now, so adios.
like friends. <laughs> Go out with your little video camera. Doesn't even have to have anything in it. <laughs> I think it's you, Bing, though. It's really you behind the camera. <laughs> it makes a difference. Mothers surrender their little children to me. <laughs> Thank you for uh, you know including my in the uh, the Pixel East Film Festival to promote uh, me television show. You've just been blackballed uh, tonight at nine. And uh, basically the premise is that uh, let's say uh, you own a restaurant and some you know guy comes in and he says you know the pepperoni tastes you know like it's from a kin like it's old and uh not fresh and uh when in reality the pepperoni was fresh that day so what i'll do is uh the restaurant will call me they'll pay me a few thousand uh you know australian bucks and uh you know i'll go down to the local uh you know outback steakhouse in australia and, um, you know, I'll kick the guy out of there. I'll say, you know, these pepperonis were fresh that die. Fresh that die. Fresh. You know, I come in with about three or four camera uh, guys, sound guys, and I have some personal, you know, bodyguards, very big guys. And uh, personally, you know, I'm only five foot three. I'm not very intimidating physically, but, you know, with all of the people that uh, accompany me, and I have a very, you know, when I go into my me deep Australian voice. It really scares people and I'm going to say, you've just been blackballed. You never come back to this restaurant. These pepperonis were fresh that die. Fresh that die. die. I'm sorry, you know, it just it takes the wind out of my, when I, you know, I get into my performance, uh, you know, mode and uh, I wish that I could be popular in America. You know, I've been trying to sell my show to NBC, ABC, uh, the BBC, all of those American outlets. And what I want you to do is write to your local congresswoman and tell her that you want Anthony Blickball on the airwaves right away. You know, in, in Australia, I'm on at 9 p.m. I mean, this is prime time Australian television. I'm no slouch. Okay, so you have to respect my in America and you know, I just feel like I don't get any damn respect and I'm sorry to care some sorry to cuss, you know, in Australia we we see a lot of, you know, kind of uh, curse words that aren't appropriate and uh, I apologize for us Aussies for, you know, saying some offensive, you know, words, you know, that in America they would not be allowed. So, you know, that's the kind of guy I am. I'm going to stick up for you, Americans. You won't be hearing the, you know, those kinds of words from me. All right. So, Anthony Blakeball, over and out. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> How the hell do you turn this damn pixel off? Thank you.
This is Dr. Gwynne speaking. This is uh, April 14th. Uh, in my office I have uh, Dave Sargent uh, who will be the subject for a hypnotic session uh, which is designed to enhance his recall of uh, day uh, the 14th of July uh, in my office also. As an observer is uh, Vince Galley. Time now, Dave, and tell us all that happened. Just go through the day and tell us all the things you can see and experience. It's a really nice day. kind of person that just likes to, you know, laugh and joke around a lot. She's got, um, light brown hair. Mm -hmm. Like she's been out in the sun a lot. Not how long? Oh, pretty long. Down her back. Can you see where her hair is torn? It looks like it's, like it's in the middle. Maybe in the middle. She likes to swing that around a lot because that's what she's doing. I guess because she likes her long hair or something. Mm -hmm. And um, she's wearing, um, and it looks like she's wearing, can't be sure, but it looks like she's wearing maybe a tie-dye blouse or something like that. I don't know for sure. Maybe not, maybe it's just millionaire blouse. There's some kind of design on it. And it looks like the girl in the black hair is starting to get in the conversation now. Mm -hmm. I think the girl in the brown called to her or something. Yeah, she seems to be getting in the conversation. Keep following them and see if they do ever get to a car of any kind. Let's see. It looks like they stopped and talked for a couple of seconds. Mm -hmm. But then she seems like she agrees. You know, she nods her head and everything and smiles. Mm -hmm. And she starts talking to the girl in the black hair. And now they both seem to be talking to the girl in the black hair. Okay. Happens next. Let's see. Oh. It looks like they take off. I can't. I can't be sure if it's all three of them or just two of them. I don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. Maybe they all walk that direction for a while. Can you, can you see where they ultimately go? They're going. They're going over towards where some people park their cars. It looks like they're. Walking down towards the main parking lot, maybe on the pavement. Mm -hmm. They went past. 
past a building. I cut off my vision. You know, I just kept walking that way. Aaron, it's your father calling. You had told me, your mom and me, that uh, you're going to be coming home for Thanksgiving this year and um, um, getting close to that time, and we're just wondering uh, when to expect you. Uh, uh, you know, it's not like you to be uh, so distant. Uh, we're getting concerned and, and kind of upset about it. You, you don't answer your phone, uh, you don't call us, you don't write to us anymore, and... Um, well, we're just looking, we just want to home for Thanksgiving. Your grandpa and grandma are going to be here, and we're all looking forward to seeing you, but uh, uh, it's not like that you don't uh, keep the lines of communication open with your folks. Give us a call, Aaron. Bye now.
1983. I was at the Central on the corner of Larrabee and Sunset on the Strip. Top Jimmy and the Rhythm Picks were performing. Guilty didn't show up, the bass player. The band was breaking up. The pickup bass player was dragging the beat. Top Jimmy pounded the microphone stand into the stage to the beat of a song looking at the bass player saying, here's the beat, here's the beat, till he was exhausted. His eyes were all, and he fell back onto the stage. About 30 seconds later, he gets up, comes to the mic and says, we're gonna go in the back room and come back and maybe we can play one song, okay. About three minutes later, they come back on stage Carlos Catarlos has a six pack. They're breaking off beers from the six pack. Okay, they're getting ready to play. Top Jimmy passed in front of Carlos. Someone said something. Next thing, Carlos Catarlos and Top Jimmy are locked into battle. And they're, they're no skinny guys, kind of both beefy guys. They're, they go down, they start rolling on stage. Amps are falling, <laughs> falling over. And, and it's a pretty wild scene. And then at one point they're back on their feet and Carlos Catalos has taught Jimmy's face pinned against the wall by the doorway as I walk out. So the last thing I see is Carlos Catalos has his hand on top Jimmy's face and top Jimmy's face is scrunched as I walk out. But then I walk out and there's a body there. I step over a body and someone said, River, River Phoenix. It was a time warp. Is this the Viper Room, owned by Johnny Depp? What's, what's going on? Bye. I think the reason I can make this pixel is that I don't remember filming because I'm not really present. And the film is no longer a person and an experience. It is a sort of thing that is happening that doesn't involve a sort of observer. I mean, what it feels like, honestly, is films are making themselves. And it's an amazing feeling because I'll film, I'll stop, I'll play it back, and I will be like, well, how did that happen? Where did that come from? How can this possibly be all coherent? Without a single organizing thought in my head?
Terry Southern wrote the screenplay for Stanley Kubrick's film Dr. Strangelove. Terry's son Niall sent me this audio cassette of unknown pixel content. Maybe this was the missing footage of the pie fight that was shot for Dr. Strangelove, but not used in the film. Kubrick usually destroys outtakes. Maybe this cassette contains the elusive outtake of the pie fight in pixel vision. One never knows. Does one. Roll them, Verndock. It's morning. I'm taking a little nap. Maya and Shauna, you two girls be good while I'm sleeping, okay? Okay. Good night. Shauna, I'm bored. We can the flower. Okay. One hour later. Hey, Maya, did you just come through the front door? And Shauna, how did you get out of the door? Did you guys leave while I was sleeping? You know you're not supposed to go outside by yourself. Where did you guys go? For a walk. You can't go for a walk. You know you have to be with a grown-up. You're underage. You're only five years old. Shana is seven. Shana's seven, but that's not good. Shana, you cannot take Maya out for a walk. What's wrong with you? Were you behind this, Shauna? Was it your idea? Yeah. Okay, Shauna, you're on punishment. What about you, Maya? Time out. Can Maya go on time out too or just Shauna? Okay, 30 seconds for you. Time out. 30 seconds later. Okay, it's been 30 seconds. Okay. Your time out is up. Okay. I'm going to go back to sleep again. I don't want you kids to do any more mischief while I'm sleeping. Okay. What do we do? What do we do? I'm bored. We should do a prank on mom. Yeah. You want to get trouble with that?
Children, go to your room. Okay. Don't use that empty egg You can come out of your rooms now. Okay. No, no more pranks, guys. I didn't raise pranksters. I wanted to raise ladies. I didn't want to raise women to be pranksters. <laughs> Hit me, she said, placing my hand on the pale curve of her breast. But I love you. Why would I want to hurt you? Because I like it. Hit me, she said. So I did. And as I watched the welt bloom pink on moon glow skin, I grew even harder inside her. It was then that I realized I could hurt people that wanted to be hurt. It was something I could be good at. 